Hey everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Cognition Ignition. Today I'm here with Richard Owen. Richard Owen is an organizational psychologist, coach, and Jungian psychological type specialist. He's the creator of the personality parts system, which I'll put the link to in for the website in the description below. Richard is also the treasurer for the British Association of Psychological Type. And today we're going to find out a bit of his understanding of type and some of the contributions his organization looks to bring to type. Uh, for anyone curious, Richard, uh, his type preferences are INTJ. And um, I'm going to hand it over to him to tell you a little bit about what organizational psychologists do and his contributions with the British Association of Psychological Type. Hi, thank you. Um, nice to be here. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, I'd, I'd studied um, my MSc, uh, master's degree in organizational psychology. Um, so I think the titles of things are slightly different in the UK from the US. Um, I mean, you've broadly got the area of IO psychology over there, industrial organizational psychology, although you'd be organizational with a Z rather than an S. Um, but yeah, essentially it's the application of psychology in the workplace broadly. And we also have the term occupational psychology, just to confuse things as well. Although that's a slightly different route in training in that um, organizational, uh, sorry, organizational psychologists like myself um, haven't necessarily done a first degree in psychology. I didn't. I actually did a chemistry degree uh, years back. Um, but then, you know, to be an occupational psychologist per se, you have to do like the course that I did with with a few a couple of little add-ons, and have done a first degree in psychology. So that's a slightly different um, route. But it's it's similar to the IO psychology in the states. So um, you guys. Uh... You guys are looking at like the interactions between uh, different people, but you're kind of bringing type into that and like seeing how you can structure an organization. Is that what you're looking for? Well, it's interesting. I mean, typology, um, it wasn't something covered in, in my training in, in the course. Um, that's something, that's just a kind of interest that I've had for, for many years before I even went and did that psychology training. I guess I'd hoped along the way that, um, you know, my, my interests in Jungian type, typology might um, kind of merge with that professional training. But, you know, much to my dismay, you know, I found the sort of professional psychology world and academia were not too fond of Jung and certainly not of the MBTI. Um, so, you know, that's one of my, you know, things I've had to deal with along the way is that um, there is um, you know, negativity towards it. You know, as most people will be aware of the articles being published and stuff on social media, I think maybe the general public don't see it as much as they do in psychology circles um, on LinkedIn and things like that. But there's, there's you know, it was it was disappointing to, to find that, you know, when I'd got into psychology originally through learning about myself through um, originally through the MBTI, um, then you know, I found that profoundly helpful and useful and interesting and, you know, went on to become a practitioner and help and use it with other people and, you know, found it to be you know, a really insightful model, but then to find that just how much it's been derided or um, excluded from kind of academia and modern personality psychology was, was disappointing, you know, to say the least and, you know, quite um, hurtful to see what a lot of people Kind of make it out to be and there's a lot of negative projection going on um all the narratives that people have probably seen a hundred times yeah um so so once you got your degree and all that like were you looking for other ways to kind of contribute to type maybe moving away from academia um and other yeah, uh, okay. it, it was something i realized that you know there, there was um community of people internationally who took typology seriously and were interested in it you know saw the, the potential and, and importance of it um you know that's what we call broadly the sort of type professional community which would kind of become organized through various um apts they were called like associations for psychological type and the background for a lot of them is i guess going stemming back to maybe as late as early as the 80s, certainly the 90s, when 
you know the MBTI is an instrument in um, in the workplace and and it's it was growing in popularity. There was a big boom. You know, it it took off massively, and then a lot of these organisations, as like user groups or communities formed around that, like wanting to kind of improve the knowledge and practice and share things. And so natural sort of groups appeared like the APTI, as it's called in the States, um, BAPT in, in the UK, there's OSAPT in, um, in Australia and New Zealand. So, you know, there's broadly now there are communities where people, not all of whom are psychologists, but quite a few are. Some are mainly just practitioners from various different backgrounds. Some just people with a really deep interest. Everyone's quite serious about understanding and, and studying the stuff and using it. And therefore, um, these organizations provide a place for people to, to meet for events, for conferences. Um, and BAPT, um, the one in the UK, is what I decided to join um, as a volunteer board member because uh, the organization is set up as a charity. So, um, you know, we have board of trustees like any other charity and um, you know, I give my time. We've got a board meeting tonight, in fact. You know, we, do, we give our time freely to, to, to you know, meet the, the aims of the charity, which are broadly to um, support the, the, the knowledge and best practice of, of psychological type. Um, are you trying to uh, maybe influence academia to kind of like, as you or do you find that these organizations do influence academia to kind of bring some acceptance to type? Or do you think it's still a struggle big time where uh, you kind of have to keep yourself distance from academia and uh, mainstream psychology? Yeah, I don't think these organizations, no, they don't have any influence on, on mainstream psychology, on academia, because I mean, the only place for that to happen would be in publishing, in, in, you know, in journals and so on, become part of the literature, essentially. And that was one of the big issues that the MBTI had was that you know, quite early on, psychologists had issues with it. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, which we can get into. But you know, essentially, the, the, the issues were there from the start, even when Isabel Briggs Myers um, we went to the company, I forget the name of the company, the, the company that also published the SAT exams in the States. Um, it was the educational test, educational testing something. Anyway, they were the organization that initially published the MBTI on a, on a wide scale. But there was kind of internal conflict. There was people within that organization, psychologists who didn't like her and what she did. She was kind of different to them. You know, she came from a different background, different sets of ideas, a completely different tradition. There was already like that conflict there. And Jung himself came into conflict with, with from, from the people in, in the um, in the mainstream of psychology. You know, it, it's just it's always been there. And therefore it kind of went through the decades with it. Um, and then there was yeah, it was the ground of it was always there. And yeah, one, one of the things was that rather than like keep pushing and integrating into mainstream literature, researchers then with, withdrew into their own, like, well, if you're not going to, if they're not interested, they're not going to listen. Like, it's, it's, it's no point banging our heads on a wall. Let's go and have our own thing over here. So they, then the CAPT, Center of Applications for Psychological Type in Florida, you know, they had their own journal. Um, but it's not like a mainstream recognized peer review journal. Um, it was just for typology stuff. And, you know, they, there was that they kind of still are the guardians of the, the, the literature of type research. You know, they've got a, my, a library called the Milo library, which people can access to the database online and, and go back. And there's so much stuff, so many studies over decades in on MBTI. There's some stuff in mainstream journals and you can find stuff out there on um, Google Scholar, you know, if you think like obviously the big five as a model has got millions and millions of hits on Google Scholar, but MBTI is kind of second to that. You think about it, it's got even in the main, even Google Scholar, it's got more literature citations, um, hits under the searches than, than it does for, um, for any other sort of independent individual model or instrument. Um, there's lots of things, you know, you imagine things like Hogan, for instance, that's another personality 
model sort of instrument set of instruments that is out there i've trained in that as well and um basically um yeah there's not as much literature that's used hogan in 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 academic research there's less of that than there is stuff that's used mbti so you know there's a lot of stuff out there but th this withdrawing of the community and people into a more insular kind of thing just say well sod it we'll go and do our own thing anyway it kind of had that had a lasting negative impact because then again then people academics would use the argument well you know we, we, we're not recognizing that research and because it's not in our journals it's not in our stuff that we know part of me wonders if young would uh, appreciate that though in a way that we kept it out of academia just because the way he looked at things um I think he kind of knew academia was taking over and with his merging of uh, opposites and overcoming opposites, I do think he kind of wanted to give the people who weren't in academia too the opportunity to understand human psychology and each other themselves, right? Um, I, I wonder if Jung would be would really appreciate that. It, it didn't necessarily have to be to in academia to be so well known. It's interesting. I think he would appreciate the independence of that. The yeah. fact that if you have a way of thinking about the world, then be true to that and go out and put it out there, um, which is exactly what he did, you know. Um, and in a sense, you know, his legacy has been you know, analytical psychology, you know, as a train, as a psychotherapy modality, you know, that's got its own niche and, and its own institutes and things in a sense. So that's separate to other areas of psychotherapy, for instance, as well. So it's come the same things happened in a way. Yeah, um, without a doubt. Um, so um, I recently watched your um, 100 years of misunderstanding. It was 100 years since uh, the writing of psychological types. And there were a few points that I just wanted you to uh, kind of bring up in here. Um, what, what were some of the main misunderstandings that you think maybe people um, still uh, experience when they're getting into type. I know one of the big ones is going to be like uh, the difference between traits and types. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, anything else, or even if you want to talk about the difference between trait and type. So sure, yeah. I mean, it's an important um, distinction because they're, they're just different ways of looking at personality, you know, personality broadly being ind individual differences between people in um, a set of things like they often mentioned th thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. But you know, there's a whole realm of like psychological activity in the mind and and then behavior as it's overtly go like expressed. Um, but trait, it's an interesting one because it, it's basically a descriptive model and there's lots of things in the lit. It's about describing and you think about it in, in an analogy, it's like if you, in, in medicine, like you've got the description of symptoms, you know, you've got like, you know, this, there's this um, lesion that's like three millimeters wide and it's in this exact position that we describe using various different terms. I don't know, there's lots of ways to be very specific and descriptive about the world. And, you know, in the medical world, I guess that's how we describe illness through symptoms, like you describe the exact symptoms of something. So it's sim similar in, in the sense, um, you know, trait, trait models are, are broadly descriptive of what behaviours are um, manifesting themselves and, to, and somehow quantifying that under various different dimensions or categories um, and so the, obviously the most popular model being the big five where they've basically whittled down thousands of descriptive words that describe how people are into these five different consistent categories um, that describe people so it's kind of essentially it's like surface level descriptive this is how you are in these dis different categories it, quantifying on on those categories how much of it you have I, I sort of say it's like top trumps, you know, that game where you have the cards. You have that in the state, yeah, every, everyone's got that, right? So, you know, you can have top trumps on everything from like, um, like, you know, you can be top trumps obviously for cars, things like that, obvious things for superheroes, like, you know, even for, for all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing. You have those little bars showing how much of something you have, you quantify it relative to other people and then to other 
and, and it's always relatively to, yeah relative it's normative so it's it's comparative to a group or of other people or to the population in some way you, he's kind of ranked in, in a distribution where you would sit um and that's 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 what they call um you know in psychology like um between person analysis so the the kind of way that you know they measure lots of people on on a, on dimensions on, on on questionnaires and they throw all the all of the data from all the people together into you know software that analyzes it and then they come out with the, the covariance as they're called the patterns of how between the people the 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 the, the ranking of certain um words tend to track each other like when one's high one's high the other one's low the other one's one's low the other one's low etc and so through those patterns of covariance they draw out where the which ones tend to track each other more closely and therefore bundle them together into bigger higher higher factors that that basically relate to each other i guess that's how that's kind of factor analysis that's how so they get lots of data from lots of people in the whole population and, and then bundle it all and analyze it so that's between person now type is comes from a very different way of looking at personality like from jung it's essentially a dynamic model of mental processes and it's within person so there's these two ways of looking at things like between person and within person and type comes from the tradition of within person but that's something that like for a long time wasn't really um in fashion in personality science um partly because the whole way it was going and, and this was around the time jung was kind of doing his work the behaviorists were taking over right so you've got people like skinner for instance you know the behaviorists especially in america had such a huge impact on on psychology and the way that it was done and the way that the mindset of it transpired um that shaped it completely and unfortunately it was in a lot of conflicts with the sort of way jung was doing things because He's from a psychotherapy background and a very internal, like introverted kind of person who for him, it was all in, in, it was all literally within the person interior, about phenomenology, about experience, about exploring the mind from within. And that just was not part of the, the mode of like psychology in the early 20th century. So it's kind of, you know, it didn't really, it wasn't compatible. Um, you know, since the 60s, there has been, since the cognitive revolution, you know, mental processes came back onto the table, but albeit in a slightly different way, you know, Jung's model of the psyche wasn't how cognitive psychology saw things. That's more this kind of information processing, almost computer analogy model of the mind. And, but, you know, there is more modern and recent research where people are going back to looking at dynamic process models of personality. What are the mental processes, the psychological functions underlying um, the, the traits that we're measuring? Because they don't necessarily match up like one to one. You know, let's say the openness to experience um, trait or factor. They're not. It's there isn't just one brain region or, or or one mental process, one network in the brain that just just is completely 100% responsible for that and causes it. And there's lots of things that correlate with it, but you know, it's not that simple. It's like the, the big five is it's wherever it comes, you know, there's these things that everyone agrees are real and exist. these, these five factors, these categories. In fact, there's a whole hierarchy. There's, there's two factors, then five, then 30 facets. And then there's, there's a whole hierarchy, but you know, essentially whatever those things are, they don't seem to necessarily be reflective of fundamental psychological processes. You know, each one of them isn't just a process that they're like kind of abstract, they're abstracted qualities that might in each of them themselves partly relate to different mental processes that underlie the whole thing. So that makes would you say that the traits are more like, are they circumstantial, like based on they're more based on 
how your underlying cognition ends up interacting with the world that your traits are actually recognized. Well, they tend to be <laughs> the way that you interpret something like the Neo as an instrument, like the Neo PI3 or PIR, is you kind of interpret it behaviorally um, to say that it's basically like you've indicated that you tend to behave in this way somewhat more than the other, the average person, for instance. And it's like, it's almost like collapsing it to behavior. Um, but the complexity is that, and, and this is what, <laughs> there was the situationalists, the, the people, that, the constructivists, that, um, the social psychologists that had issue with the, some of the early trait psychology people because they were saying, well, yeah, but we, we can behave completely differently in different situations and, and the environment has a huge impact. And, and yes, it does. And um, the way I look at it is there's, there's, there's different things that influence our behavior, one of which is our disposition. So that's like, essentially your inclination like within the psychological system there's something that's like kind of naturally pulling you one way than the other and that's 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 essentially what i think type is or is, is supposed to be looking at yeah it's disposition it's about you know all other things being equal where do i naturally go to where do i drift to where where's the where's the pull you know in the system and that's the dispositional impact but then you, you do have in, you know, environmental situational stuff that, that forces you to be a certain way in a moment, like in a, in a state. Because everything comes back to states, you know, <laughs> essentially states being in the moment specific experiences like of, of what's going on. And so within those, in those state moments, you've got disposition like pulling on your system to be a certain way, the, the environment potentially forcing you to be a certain way. And you've got and elements of what you call volition, like intent, intent, like you could say, I know, I sod the environment, screw my disposition, I'm going to be like this, because I want to be, and I'm going to bloody well do it, right? <laughs> Whether you believe free will exists or not, and that's a debate in itself, you know, we've, we've got some sense of volition of having control over what we do, and therefore that's another factor. So you think there's, a, like for me, I think there's like a tug of war between these, these, these three things that influence our behaviour, but yet the sort of trait models kind of more like look at the behavior, the, the, the behavior as it is. And the traits do talk about disposition, but it's almost like they've kind of collapsed it a bit um, between the two. Um, but this, 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 you can definitely pick it apart. And I think that's the point of type is that it's looking you know, within yourself to see if you can locate that disposition you can separate it from how you're intentionally trying to be and how the environment's forcing you to be. Um, I think, I don't know if that's, I've gone off a tangent and not answered your question, but well, bring me back to the question. Probably up to this, like, so if you can identify that in, within yourself, <clears throat> you can also begin interacting with the environment differently, right? Where traits don't necessarily give you that option in a way, right? Um, uh, a time now I see if you can recognize that disposition within yourself, you can begin changing the scenarios to meet that disposition of where you're actually drawn to. Where with traits, it seems like it doesn't um, count the fact that you can do that. Like we said, free will, that you can actually move yourself to an environment that matches that disposition in a way. It's interesting. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that you know, intentional change of behavior. It certainly is there within, you know, traits, models, and, and that sort of way of looking at things. But I'm trying to get at the difference, the fundamental difference that, you know, the, the, the between person analysis of abstract descriptive qualities is like the trait way. And then the, the within person, I guess, like experiential, observation with the system from within the person and the dynamics that are going on in internally is really the kind of the coming from that Jungian route. Yeah, uh, we you just brought, brought up, uh, I saw your model where you said that what we think of the abstracted is backwards. You had introversion and extroversion on top. 
and you had the eight functions underneath, right? <clears throat> I'm just mm -hmm. going into functions now. I know you can do this with the traits. And that like <clears throat> the introversion and extroversion are more, are less abstracted or are they more abstracted? So introversion and extroversion in, in the Jungian model are, are separated out ideas are more abstracted. They're more taken out of context of experience. Yeah. And then pulling on the fact that your actual functions are the concrete, like um, what's actually happening, right? That's how you would see it. And that yeah. more explanation is, oh, that's an introvert, that's an extrovert, but really there, there's more concrete going on. They're introvertedly thinking or introvertedly feeling, mm. right? Yeah, so let's take that example on, um, you know, so, and I've got quotes from Jung, that, you know, kind of back up my, my position on this. Although he's also, there's also quotes from him that kind of back up the, the, the abstracted model that you've just described, you know, where you've got the set, the basic functions, sensing, intuition, thinking, feeling, and the separated, separate intro, introversion, extroversion, and this idea of it, them modifying the functions and you you ending up with these eight kind of combinations of the the eight functions or function attitudes um so yeah i i believe that the basically the the real basis of the jungian model is that there's there's eight fundamental domains of mental processing which are we'd call the eight functions yeah and then you know four of those those happen to have in common that they are more oriented by internal like subjective experience and they kind of focus in and they keep looping back into subjective experience and four of them just happen to share the quality that they are that they are oriented by the object the objective world and and tend to loop back out and expand out into that and focus their, their attention towards that so you know, the former of those being the introverted functions and the latter being the extrovert and that's what Jung's description of introversion extroversion is it's like orientation by the subjective factor or the objective factor they're different to what extroversion is described as in a trait behavioral model oh but, yeah without a doubt you know uh, i have looked at the big five a lot um do you do you dislike the big five or do you just think that um it's just not the end all be all of psychology in a way I think it's fine. Like anything, it's it's a it's a perspective on things. It's a useful perspective. It's 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 interesting. It's it's done. There's a lot of work's gone into it. What I dislike is traitism, like the idea that like this is the way, to quote the Mandalorian, you know, <laughs> this is the only way to look at personality, and uh, this is the this is how it has to be, and 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 anything else is wrong. You know, that's. That seems crazy because there's, there's now plenty of literature you know, going back into, I said, dynamic models of personality. It's it's back on the agenda, but there's still people who've gone to college and, and studied and only been presented with trait views of personality and therefore don't know anything else. And, and they want to justify their hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of training by going out and attacking other people by saying, saying they're idiots. Um, yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah, and then I, I do wonder if like people do confuse type and traits these days. Um, that, uh, that with a push for type, people take traits to push for type. Uh, do you ever find that? Well, yeah, if you think like a lot of how we even use type is, is um, it's kind of in a trait way, like looking at the the behaviors that you might expect from certain types. Um, you know, you're basically looking at it from behavioral and from trait ways to try and recognize it. And yeah, people, there is even like, you know, the 16 personalities assessment, which a lot of people even think is now the MBTI, which it isn't. The, the trouble with that is that is actually a trait measure um, it's, a, it's actually a big five measure that's been adapted to masquerade as a type tool. It's, it's not actually a type tool from the ground up. It's, um, it's, it's taking a normative approach and, and a kind of a, a, a split, a split point, it's taking an arbitrary split point of, of, um, quantified trait kind of measures. And that's exactly what, um, type is not supposed to be 
So even in that sense, it's got confused that probably the most now widely used questionnaire on the internet is actually a trait questionnaire, which is posing as a type questionnaire. I feel with that, you get just more, and actually I've heard you say this, uh, more of a snapshot than the like development path for somebody. Um, mm. if, they, if they're answering to trait questions, you, they can only figure out what they can do at that point because that's how they're answering based on their current environment where with type, I feel mm. it is a longer, it is almost a longer process of understanding your type, I would say, um, because there's the development factor to it. You, you almost have to do, mm. even if you're a forward thinker, you have to look backwards in order to fully understand where traits you can pick up why somebody is, or even, and even behaviorism, why somebody's behaving that way in a specific time, which mm. is, that's given pointing to the type, you know? Um, the development, like you have to, with type, you can figure out where did they pick up those traits in a way? Why did they pick up that trait? Uh, why did they become more open than somebody? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, yes, yeah, should we get into that? Because that's quite an important point. This this idea of um, yeah, how I think type should be understood as a, a developmental path pathway, as I call it, a developmental pathway. There's, so those 16 MBTI types are developmental pathways in my book, um, by which they're, they're dispositional pathways. They're not ones we've chosen. And the point is that the, the choices that we make to be certain ways and the environment's forces on us may or may not um, align with that disposition, which can make it even more tricky to, to, to pick apart the underlying type. So that's that's why it's not a simple process for a lot of people to work out their type. But you're right that, that essentially, if you're looking at it's, it's Okay, any kind of like trait questionnaire, yeah, it's like a snapshot, like a descriptive snapshot within a kind of recent period of time. They say often that like, you know, something like a, tra a trait questionnaire result is, is, is kind of valid for like, say, a year or something, and then you might have to do it again. The, the thing is that whenever you're looking at personality, you are doing some kind of averaging over time. And the time context is really important, and yet it's, it's never really specified clearly enough, considering that that's what you're actually doing. And, and when it's not specified, people could be going off and doing all kinds of different things. Like, you know, so for instance, if you don't specify the time context, one person might be trying to average out their their behavior over their entire lifetime. One person might be doing it over the last week <laughs> or the last day. I mean, you know, there's that much like scope for the time context. And bizarrely, it isn't even specified clearly enough when you actually take an instrument. But I guess with trait instrument, like they broadly like by that thing I just said, they're kind of in, uh, implying that most people are sort of going off roughly a, a kind of past year context. Like they're looking at sort of, you know, it's basically an averaging of like abstract qualities across different states of being within that year period that you're then putting into these like quantified numbers. Um, and, and how the brain actually does that is kind of bizarre. You know, it's not even that scientific. It's very intuitive for someone to make to, to do that process. If you think about it. You know, to do it scientifically, you would you would actually go and observe someone for a year and and note down the states minute by minute, or have a have a mobile phone app do that, and then actually um, come out with a result. But the fact that you're asking someone to do that out of their memory, out of the top of the top of their head, is is even a crazy thing in itself. But anyway, I digress. But the point is that you, you're asking people to do that. You're getting a snapshot over a period, recent period of time, over your of quantified amounts of behaviour. What you need to do with type, I think, is look at your entire life history, um, where you are now, and be aware that where you are now as a snapshot is like your type plus your life story. You know, it's your underlying type disposition plus, you know, what the environment has forced you to have to adapt to and what you've decided intentionally to adapt yourself to um added on to the underlying typology yeah it's almost like the through line in a way of like how all the factors get processed um one thing that i've thought about is i have a son and you have kids um and yeah. i've thought about uh 
I, I've been watching his development. I try not to type him, but to actually watch his functions <laughs> happen. And I do wonder if like, if enough people actually picked up type and were able to do that, if we would be able to like help people like kind of at a younger age, actually understand how they're functioning. Um, kind of regardless of the traits, uh, because if they can understand their disposition somewhat earlier, uh, and this takes like uh, very intensive, uh, it's very intensive paying attention to your child as a parent to kind of understand mm -hmm. functioning that they're using, but mm -hmm. uh, use that more so. Because I do sometimes feel like when people get to say 25 and they're trying to take these tests and find out themselves, there is so much mixing going on that it is, almost, like you said, it could be hard to find out their type. They're, they're looking at a bunch of different states, whereas a parent, you can watch each state that your child can go into in a way and to kind of understand what's what's happening for them that's allowing them to enter those states that, of behavior mm -hmm. that they're entering into, right? Mm -hmm. You can start to see the patterns, yeah, certainly as a parent. I mean, it's harder to spot the intro introverted processes because they're internal, and especially if a child's not old enough to reflect and talk, explain what's going on inside its own experience. Um, but you know, you can still figure it out. Um, you know, cause what sort of, um, things are they, are they coming out with? Like, um, you know, I think quite early on, we had the sense that our daughter, our oldest daughter was an introverted sensation type, introverted sensing type. Um, you know, she was clearly drawn inwards to some kind of experience and as she grew older and developed language. It became more clear that we saw you know, she seemed to be going back into specific concrete memory kind of states, you know, and recalling and reliving, re-experiencing stuff. Her her grasp of um, memory and, and concrete material of experience was just really, really precocious. Like, and that's that's what our dominant functions like. It's precocious. It's like early developing. It's like kind of ahead of its time, you know. Um, you can spot that in people. Yeah, and I, to me, uh, I think uh, that may be a good way of making <clears throat> type more acceptable. Um, because I do think that, I personally think it's a great tool when somebody can actually develop with it rather than just categorizing somebody on their name. And I think that like, <laughs> sometimes, like if somebody didn't grow up um, in an environment that, uh, promoted their disposition, uh, it can have problems later on in a way. Um, so that's just my application of type right now. I do use it in business as well, but I think that one of the best ways to use it is like teaching parents to do that um, because that disposition as you grow is so impacted by the outer world, no matter what, even though it's so innate to you, it could be so hard to get in touch with in a way, um, recognize. Uh, so. That was just something that I was thinking about from what you said. That's a really good point. You know, it's important that we at least validate the existence or, or right for someone to be in, in a certain mode of mental processing that if that's where they're habitually going, you know, it's sincerely, seriously damaging to someone's sense of self-worth if, if, you know, they're, they're constantly just naturally drawn to being a certain way that, that becomes like, like always attacked and put down all the time. <laughs> so, um, okay. Then, um, so something else I wanted to bring up was, um, in, in your talk, what I heard you talk about was, um, that Carl, Carl Jung and even My Myers-Briggs had different views on type. And uh, Young always did see that there was like a problem with typing, like eventually like through development, you overcome the one-sidedness where I think uh, Myers and Briggs kind of uh, promoted that one-sidedness, like you know, almost an ego development in a way. Um, what do you think? Do you think that one is more accurate than the other? Do you think that um, it's just two, uh, two different sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. uh, in Buddhism, it's believed that you need to develop an ego in order to lose your ego, right? Um, in, a, in a lot of philosophies, that's kind of a thing. So I'm wondering if uh, Isabel Myers and Briggs, um, they, if they were actually trying to influence the ego development, where Jung was seeing people 
who had maybe um, were, were more like an ego dissolution state or where their ego was wounded at some point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my basic take on it is that like, what you're saying, like from that Buddhist perspective, that essentially it's part of the journey, like, you know, to become one sided um, before you can then reintegrate. It's like you have to take something apart before you can put it back together again. That's the basic premise. I think, you know, I think um, Jung was looking at, you know, really high level idealized stuff with, with like individuation, you know, this kind of state end state um of like totality and wholeness and uh, integration um you know god I, you know I, I mean when you look at it in reality you know that's that's kind of like an almost like an unachievable target you know you kind of this this end point whatever that is you know i think it's just a going in that direction that, um but yeah i think you need a grounding in that sort of what he called like differentiation first um you know that, that that there's been this separation um out of you know and focus because you can't focus your attention just obviously the point is attention is selective you can't you can't really develop something without using it or doing it and to use it and do it you have to focus your attention on it and attention is naturally selective so you can't focus your attention on everything all at once so by default it's almost like you have to become one-sided and a bit specialized in some way to in order to, to develop anything well um to any higher level because if you try to do everything all at once you'd only ever be mediocre at everything at maximum <laughs> and possibly just exhausted so it's kind of it's a part of nature i guess it's natural limitations that we, we've had to develop this way of, of specializing and I guess it's good for society as well that people specialize naturally down different development paths and therefore different people do different roles in society. I guess that's the way I look at it. It's evolutionary. It's, it's kind of, it's natural. Um, but for the individual, yeah, I don't think there's any way around a degree of one-sidedness of developing you know, slightly out of out of balance and, and, and owning that. So in a sense, you know, Elizabeth Bell Briggs Myers was was right. You know, you do have to own that and um I can embody it in order to then go beyond it. But the going beyond and whether that's something you should do or not, yeah, again that's where where Jung comes in. You saw that's the whole point is to go beyond and and to transcend it. Um and I think, you know, Steve Myers, he's he's a really great writer. He's not related to the Myers-Briggs family, but he's a great current writer and um, scholar. He said in his books, you know, that that's so basically Isabel didn't see the, the need to go beyond that. You know, we could be happy with being a well, well developed, but comp with, with complementary development, you know, in a sense that just enough to get by of the other bits, um, but not this idealized sort of um, individuation. That, that really kind of goes beyond the type. See, <clears throat> even, and, and what Young was expressing, I believe that he did, because, you know, he he always wanted to write the psychological types. And that's when I, when I watched your presentation, I was like, yeah, that, and he was busy with his clients at the time and he couldn't do it, but he had the pressure. And to do that, I think that was like his individuation process. Instead of just being the person who was recognizing it and treating it, if he didn't write psychological types, I feel like he would have died unsatisfied in a way because he, he didn't reach that uh, higher, higher way of being um, through writing everything that he had accumulated throughout his life. I do wonder if that's more just of a midlife thing. If, if they were looking, if, if MBTI is looking more for like a younger generation who, who has to do that. And they did, they wouldn't want to tell a younger generation that like, eventually mm -hmm. you're going to have to expand consciousness in a way, your own consciousness in a way um, through integrating your opposites. Um, because I do believe that's kind of what Young was doing when he decided to write psychological types. I think he uh, practiced his own philosophy. I guess he was trying to. I mean, he, he'd, for him, he'd, he'd just come out of it, like, or was coming out of his, his um, 
seven year like dark dark night of um like of his soul basically you know his red book period you know and he was starting to write i think it probably overlaps a bit you know when he's writing psychological types so a lot of his own process comes is part of that but it's it's a very different kind of book to the red book it's not it doesn't have the kind of the, the mystical kind of qualities it's very but more from a psychological philosophical point of view but I think, and he was only he was only forty five, I think, when he published Psychological Types, which is how old I am. Which I thought I always find really bizarre. I'm like, wow, you know, to this point in life, to have kind of written something like that, and already have written other books of like he had as well. So, um, he wasn't even that far on his career realistically, <laughs> compared, you know, because he lived a long time. So, but yeah, the point. I think there is a fundamental difference, and you know, there's such a broader um richness of like scholarship and and understanding of psychology and of the world behind his model behind everything that he did there's a whole like universe of stuff that he was interested in and and that's all there and, and the more you dig into that the more you start to appreciate where psychological types is coming from but for someone without that whole a universe of material behind it just coming to to meet for the first time mbti coming at them in some kind of online questionnaire or something it's easy to misunderstand it and mistaken it because it's you know there's a lot of deep stuff behind it yeah i mean truthfully he was even interested in albert einstein's work at the time um, with quantum physics which still people don't even in today's day, even though it's generally accepted, people don't understand what it is. So I can only imagine what people were thinking when he was writing his books, because I mean, and um, he's, I mean, he's, he basically reviewed every philosopher that is mainstream, a straight mainstream philosopher and trying to understand their, their underlying cognition. Um, he did have a lot more than just the psychological aspect of it. I would say, I agree with you there. Um, and I do think that at that point in time, if you had read what he was reading, it may have been woo-woo, uh, or what he was writing, uh, it may have seemed woo-woo. I guess we still use that word. But um, I think it's, um, I mean, I think he was ahead of his time in all reality. Now he was making the connections that science was actually um, <clears throat> accepting at the time to the human psyche. Um, I think he was ahead of his time. I don't know. <coughs> yeah, I guess he was. And, and it's interesting that now, you know, psychology is coming back around to this dynamic process way of looking at personality. You know, and, you know, and he was doing it back then. Other people were doing it back then as well, though. You know, it's easy to put like Jung out there as completely unique. And all of his ideas came from somewhere, pretty much, you know. And, and it's just that he's a convenient package for all those things. As a, as a kind of landmark for the modern times of where they might as well have started for all of us because we're not going to go any further back but you know he states his own sources and he goes back and digs into the what underlies what he did it's just a lot you know it'd be too much for us in the modern day for us to all understand the entire background of everything so we kind of for a lot of us he's, he's a he's kind of a, a jumping off point into into this what is kind of a slightly alternative way of looking at psychology now in a and in a very interdisciplinary way, I think that's one of his greatest strengths is that he he didn't have boundaries to his scholarship. He was like he was looking everywhere for the answers and drawing together the knowledge from all the sources that he could. Um, and that sort of breadth is partly missing today. Yeah, I've always liked how Young said consciousness streams in us from the outside in through our sense perception because. Yeah. Um, you can almost tell that's how he lived his life. Even if he was an introvert, he, he accepted that he needed to engage outwardly and pull things in, I believe, in order to interpret what was actually, um, what he was actually seeing, you know? And then he actually had to work with his extroverted sense perception a lot. It may have been, I do believe it was probably his inferior function, but um, I do think he embraced it in a way. Because whenever, when I, right when I read that, actually, I was really impressed because I'm like, he's definitely an intuitive, but he understood the importance of that extroverted sense perception. Mm. And uh, I don't know, 
that was just something I've always noticed about him. Yeah, I think, you know, he consumed a lot of information. He read a lot of books and yeah. So I mean, getting back onto the, um, you know, the differences, I guess we were, t what was the last question we were talking about? Um, it was really, is it, is, uh, is it a virtue as it's seen in MBTI or is it a problem to be overcome as Jung saw it? And I, I, I personally think there, it is two sides of one coin. I think maybe, uh, mm. Mm. And I think if you look at like Isabel Briggs Myers, um, I believe she, from my memory, she was an introverted feeling type. Um, I've that, heard that INFP, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think partly, you know, her philosophy on it was, was partly her own experience. And for her to own introverted feeling as a dominant function, for her to be okay with that. You know that was probably part of her journey it's it's difficult in you know especially in modern like 20th century which is like 20th century america when she grew up you know you think about that culture it's all very there's a lot of extroverted thinking like the, the polar opposite of that yeah. yeah she was she was trying to help the industrial age uh through through the through the test and everything uh trying to help the extroverted thinking culture actually uh, with that test in a way. Um, so it is for a lot of people, you know, what it's, it's done for a lot of people is it's, it's kind of made it okay for them to be them, be who they are. And that's, that was part of her, you know, virtue in it as that. Yes. By, by saying, you know, yes, I am an introverted feeling type or I am an introverted intuitive type and that's okay. And I'm not the only one. And there's lots of people like that. And it's a normal variation and the experiences I'm having, are, are, are kind of no, they're normal. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess really the development, what you're going to have to do is going to really depend on your type. Um, that's why I think all this research is actually great because you're going to see some people need to own their authenticity. Some people need to come into authenticity or whatever, however you mm. want to categorize introverted feeling. Um, where some people need to learn to be industrious or things like that. And some people don't. And it's, it is, I think the, the understanding we can get from type is that every person is going to have such a different development path, but if you can really understand what's internal to that person, you can really help them do that, right? I, I don't know, a thought came to mind, you know, it's a bit like that Alcoholics Anonymous thing, you know, when someone, the, the point when someone can stand up and go, yes, my name is Richard and I'm an alcoholic or whatever, you know, and, and you know, that's a starting point for then they can move on from there. Hopefully, you know, that is a place to say hey, I can work from this. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's what type is, you know, to say, okay, yeah, I'm I, for some people, it's a struggle to accept that they might be this type that, you know, might not have been viewed as a good thing in their culture, society, family, whatever. Um, you know, there might be lots of reasons why they, they, they're fighting and, and to, to be able to accept that this part of acceptance before you can then make a change. Well, Richard, I think, um, I'm going to be honest, I think we went through a lot here. I think, uh, I think I'm going to have to end it here because I do think like there's a lot of information for the viewers who are watching or yeah. going to be watching this. Uh, I don't want to uh, go too far deeper because I do think that we could lose some people. And I think I have a lot to process after this conversation, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. But I do want to, if you have anything you want to bring up before we finish this, I do want to give you that opportunity opportunity um i think you're a very well-educated person on this uh subject and i really do enjoy listening to the webinars that you put on so anything that you want to end this with i'm willing to have you yeah yeah i mean i know you're you know you're sort of like the youtuber generation like it appeals to um you know younger people who are just learning about this stuff from the start and um you know it's a journey of learning um you know beginning with yourself and, and then going into this stuff deeper and you know, I want to encourage younger people to get involved with APTs like APTI, BAPT, associations that like then give you a platform to, you know, be more serious and, and professional in, in, in understanding and using typology. Um, you know, I think that's what we need in those organizations is, is, is more involvement from the next generation, you know, of people coming through. Um, it's an opportunity to learn from older, more experienced people um and to also influence them as well and to have a whole like kind of 
dialogue about you know what how do we move this forward like you know what is the future for you know typology as a, as a as a field it would be great for it to get back into like mainstream psychology um but the people out there listening to this are potentially the people that can make that happen and and bridge that gap and stop these destructive like divisions that sprung up in the behaviorism in the early 20th century that we were talking about that of you know split off perfectly good ways for understanding yourself and and um you know we don't want to rob the world of that so you know it's up to the it's up to the younger people to to kind of join and become part of that next wave of whatever it will be yeah and i hope i can be a part of that i hope i can influence people uh you definitely do uh, so i really appreciate all that you do all the videos that you make and content you make to educate people um and thanks a lot for being here richard Thanks for having me and for reaching out. And I really appreciate it. We'll do this again, I'm sure. Thanks.